let's go. Yeah, yeah. So we, uh, my name is Jacob. Um, I serve along with uh, Fuzi and Pete and the leaders at CityGates. Uh, we are officially over a year old now as uh, CityGates, and uh, we're really thankful to God for all he has done and see this wonderful venue and the multiple services. We are in the midst of a four-part series for Christmas and New Year, which is uh, Love, Joy, Peace, and Hope. Uh, it's funny, Liz did love last week, I'm doing joy this week, and Pete's doing peace next week, and it goes in, in, in a nice rhyme with our first names, so uh, I, f I found that quite <laughs> interesting. <laughs> so we're, we're looking for someone uh, with the name Ed's to do uh, hope. Uh, it's Frank, though, so we'll have to change his name to Frank then. Um, yeah. Uh, Hank, maybe, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I'm doing joy today, and I must challenge you. the The world view on joy is very commercial, uh, especially at Christmas time. When you use the word joy out there in the world, it's a lot about Christmas, Christmas trees, gifts, shopping. Uh, what else? Dubai, Gucci, things like that. But the the uh, the scriptures we are seeing today is going to give you quite a big, uh, different, deeper view. It's like, it's like joy in this world is like a tiny stream which you have to find, search and find. But joy in the Bible is like this background we were seeing all this time of a very deep well or a deep river. And, and, and there's such a depth in the joy that comes from scripture that we would all really be lost without it. And uh, just to start you off thinking, because I thought at some point some of you were almost going to sleep, and some of you are in God's presence, obviously, and the others were wondering, what is Liz doing there? And is he going to say something or not say something? But that's just enjoying God's presence, right? And uh, I must tell you, just to wake you all up a bit, on a scale of 1 to 10, how joyful do you think you are? Uh, ten. ten. <laughs> Keep that number in your head because we come to it at the end of the message. So you can, and then when you go home, maybe ask your spouse or family or your friend, what do you think I am? Seven, eight, nine? It's a scary question to ask, I must warn you. Uh, because we have an impression of how joyful or maybe grumpy, the other angle is to look at yourself and say, how grumpy am I on a scale of 1 to 10? But I'm just throwing that question out there. I'm not asking for answers <laughs> right now. Is, 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 I'm creating trouble now. Yeah, so if you have your Bibles, don't open it. <laughs> See, I told you today was about joy, so you will laugh a bit once in a while. Don't open it because in Scripture we find the word rejoice, joy, um, and a joyful 430 times. And if I were to take you into every one of those verses, we'll be here till next, when is that, Christmas Friday maybe. <laughs> and so when I just did some research on how many really good verses are there about being joyful, there were over 50 of them. So which is why I'm saying don't open your Bibles yet. We'll see all those, not 50, we'll see a few of them. It took me a long while to bring it down to the few that really make a difference. And I'm going to, I'm going to take you through five types of joy. Say five types of joy. Five types of joy. And this is how scripture is so different from the world. Because the world, joy is something commercial and cheap. But in scripture, it means so many different things. And it's wonderful to study a word like joy at the beginning of Christmas. So let's just close our eyes for a minute. Let's pray and ask God to come. Father, come teach us your joy, that kingdom joy that you are so close to, that we need to be so close to in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. I'm just going to put up a few interesting comments on joy. Can I have a slide? That is funny. I think most of us know C.S. Lewis. He says, joy is the serious business of heaven. <laughs> serious business. It's not, it's not some frivolous thing that we feel once in a while. It's, 
it's the reason why Jesus had to come. Because we lost our joy when we stepped out of that garden. Or we didn't know what to do. As Adam and Eve, Jesus had to send his son so that our joy was restored, right? It's the serious business of heaven. So one of the things about heaven is there is a lot of joy. And there's a lot of joy because you have a God who is in control of all things. He's a happy God. He's a joyful God. He has no worries or concerns that what will tomorrow be like. He's joyful all the time, right? So it's the serious business of heaven. And joy is not that. I don't know this gentleman, but I found his statement quite interesting. He says, joy is not necessarily the absence of suffering. It's the presence of God. And funnily, his name is Sam Storm, so he must have been through a few <laughs> uh, storms to get that kind of statement out. But it's very important because I think the Word of God teaches us what is joy even in the midst of suffering and trial and temptation. We'll see those verses as well as we move, right? Okay, the five types of joy starting now. The first joy is the joy of obedience. The joy of? This is the original joy in the Garden of Eden. We were meant to be obedient. He said, don't touch that fruit from that tree. If we were obedient, we would have kept that joy. But we lost it. We lost that joy of obedience. And, and Jesus says in John 15, 10 to 11, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Let me read the last part again. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. The, when you are obedient, you retain the joy of God in your hearts. I'll give you an example. This morning, this very morning, I had to make a confession to my wife. Don't go ask her what I said, okay? And, and, and I'd forgotten about this very simple incident that happened two, three days ago. And then God was disturbing me by his spirit this morning. Go and tell her. I said, Lord, not before the preach. You know, I'll, I'll do it afterwards because I don't want to disturb myself in the zone. What if she reacts and then we get into a, a discussion on the way to the, uh, the church? It's not a good thing. But then he said, no, do it now. I said, okay, when she comes down. And what I noticed in my spirit was the moment I was obedient and I told her, I have this thing to confess, two, three days back, blah, 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 blah. She took it well, thank God. And then that worry or that stress lifted and my joy was back. My joy was back. And you will find sometimes in obedience as you obey God in the small things, in the big things. And if God tells you in your conscience, do this or don't do that. And that difference of your obedience decides whether you retain your joy or you, or you lose your joy. And it's crucial sometimes that we understand that the original intent of God was that we live in obedience. And even when Jesus came, I mean, who do you think is the most obedient person in Scripture apart from Christ? Because Jesus said, I do nothing of my own. What, my, what I see my father do, that I do, right? But who other than Jesus, you think, what incident comes to your mind as someone who was seriously obedient? The one that hits me most of the time is Abraham taking his son Isaac up that mountain in obedience to what God asked him to do, even though it was crazy, it was difficult, and it, this was the son of promise that was given to him. But he still went and was obedient. And, and, and when you see obedience like that, you start thinking, there is a joy in obeying and following God, right? My, my version of disobedience as I grew up was a bit different. So we had a home where my mom was a very strong personality when we were growing up. My dad was busy playing cricket and at work. He played cricket till he was 40 something. And mom was the disciplinarian at home. 
And my brother, my elder brother, was the one who argued all the time, disagreed with mom, had the arguments. My version of disobedience was I would say yes to everything. Whatever she asked, I would say, yes, yes, we'll get it done. But I would never do anything. I would do whatever I wanted. Then my brother would come to me and say, you can't do this, you know. You just say yes and you get rid of the arguments, but you do your own thing. But you know, I don't know what your version of disobedience is. Do you say yes to God for everything and then end up doing your own thing like me? Or do you argue with God all the time but still reluctantly do? It's like the parable of the two sons, right? One said yes, yes, and did nothing. One said no, no, but ended up doing. In the end, it's a search of our hearts to see how obedient we are. Not just because we have to be obedient, because we want to keep our joy, right? So, first type of joy, stay obedient. Jesus himself was obedient, in case you're thinking this is an Old Testament concept. That's John 15, 5 up there. Joy number two, the joy of our salvation. That's wonderful, isn't it? That's why we are here. This is Christmas time. We are talking about a certain joy that comes from our salvation. Why did this joy have to come? Because we didn't do the first joy properly. Because there was no obedience, there had to be salvation. right? So God then replaces it. Since these disobedient people didn't follow what I asked them to, I will send them this second joy, the joy of our salvation. Let's read Luke 2, 9-11. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Can you imagine what that would be like? And they were filled with great fear. These are the shepherds that Jacob John was talking about. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you what? Good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So I always had this different view of Christmas, and you'll have to either agree with me or disagree, you're free to. This is not scripture, this is just my view of what would it have been in the father's heart when he decided to send his son as a savior to the world. We celebrate it as a joyous occasion. That's what the word of God says we do, that unto you a savior is born. This is good news of great joy. But there's this parable in the New Testament that talks about a father sending the hired servants to the vineyard. You remember the parable of the vineyard? They sent the servants and they killed the servants and then he sent the son and they killed the son, right? And, and, and you start thinking of Christmas from the father's heart and say it must have been difficult. It's, it's like when you send your children out to get their education or they get their first job and they leave the home, it's not, it, it is a happy feeling, but it's also a, a, a feeling that you sit there and worry about. And so, if you look at Christmas from the Father's heart, we say it's the joy of our salvation, but it's also a huge and difficult decision for the Father to say, you have to go. We have to save these people. And then Jesus says, yes, I will. I will go. I love them as much as you do. And that's what happened with Christmas, right? When I was about... 14, I first heard uh, the gospel preached. I was in a vacation Bible school somewhere in, in the south of India. And it was a simple uh, uh, statement from a Methodist pastor. Uh, uh, and he said he'd just come back from being ordained, and Peter Francis was his name. And he just said, this is the gospel. And all you do is believe that Jesus Christ died for you and died for your sin, and in that belief, uh, you will be born again and you will enter heaven just because you believe for God so loved the world that he gave his only son and whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. And that day I crossed a doorway into a new life in Christ. And over that, say, few years, some better than others, I found that relationship with God really mattered. And my life in him was secure whether I always, you know, lived to the standard that God wanted me to or fell short of it, I knew his love for me 
because every time I stood there and looked at the cross, I knew he loved me, right? So I want to, I want to make that open offer to you this morning that if there's someone here who wants to believe that this Jesus is the one who died for me and I believe in him, come and we'll pray together at the end of this service. And this may be your day of enter into that joy of our salvation. There's a couple of other verses just to show you that God meant serious business. Let's just move to the next slide. Look at this. This is from the Old Testament and it talks about the joy of salvation. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt my God for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. This is that famous Isaiah chapter uh, where Jesus reads in the synagogue the spirit of the Lord is upon me and that's part of that chapter and he says already in the Old Testament right at the beginning God had already planned our salvation. He was going to give us this robe of righteousness and these garments of salvation so you are dressed differently when you are born again and you have that joy around you. It's part of who you are and that joy is what you all are dressed in today in reds and various colors. It's actually in my eyes like the blood of Jesus that you are sitting dressed in. Not, I, I am not reminded so much of Santa Claus, so please forgive me. Uh, and then look at 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. It says, though you have not seen him, this is Peter writing to the churches in Asia, uh, the dispersed ones, he says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy, rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy. There are people that will only believe what they see. And there are people who will believe by faith even what they do not see. And this is the funny thing about believing in a savior whom you have not physically seen. And, and the evidence of that is what the scripture says, when you start believing, the Holy Spirit comes and seals you. And part of that sealing of the Holy Spirit in your spirit is an inexplicable joy. There is something that wakes up in your spirit which was dead all this time because your conscience was dead. But when you say, yes, Lord, I believe you died for me, there is a joy that settles inside your heart. And you can, you, Pete says, I am, but every one of you will, will kind of nod there. I can see so many people nodding that the joy comes in the day you believe. Okay, so let's go to joy number three, the joy of believing. Okay. It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Now there's a big connection between hope and joy. It's not easy to explain, but I'll try. Easiest way to understand that is where there is no hope, there's no joy. Let's assume you're in a hopeless situation You've tried every option you can, and there are people here in that exact situation. I don't know whether it's about your, your work, or your career, or your family, or your health. But there is a situation that looks hopeless. And when situations look hopeless, what happens firstly is the joy dies. You feel a sinking feeling in your heart. And that's what this verse is talking about. May the God of hope fill you with all joy, which means the first thing that God does in that situation is to give you hope. And when the hope comes back into your situation, the joy lifts again, right? There is a relationship between hope and joy, okay? So I leave the, uh, the rest to Frank for uh, first, first, of, uh, first service of the new year. But joy comes from believing. So uh, for me, the big stories in scripture about hope is when uh, Israel was running away from Egypt and they hit the Red Sea. And one side they had the sea and the other side was the army and there was nowhere to go, right? Would you call that a hopeless situation? There was nothing left, right? You either drown in the deep waters or you get killed by the Egyptians. 
But then Moses said, be strong and be firm and see what your salvation happened today in that hopeless situation. And I must tell you, if you are in that kind of scenario, God can still come through. In your worst situation where every side seems to be blocked and there seems to be no way out, God can make a way where it seems impossible to find a way. Even logically, you've tried everything possible. I want you to turn to God today and say, Lord, I put my trust in you. I want to put my hope in you. And allow the joy of the Lord to fill your spirit in that situation you're in. Because God can do things that we can't even think of. He has plans you don't even know of, right? Let's go, joy number four. This is one joy I would not advise to anybody, but we will go through this anyway because it's a crucial part of understanding what biblical joy is, right? Joy in the midst of suffering, and it says here, James 1, 2 to 4, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, so you go to trial number one, say, hi, nice to meet you. And trial number two comes, and he says, when you meet, so you say, hi, trial number two, and trial number three, various kinds of trial. And, and, and what does the word of God say? Count it all. That is not easy. Huh? That is not easy at all. For you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Let's go for another couple of verses. Next slide. Romans 5, 3 to 5. Not only that, but we rejoice. We what? We rejoice in our? This is terrible. Somebody else wrote this Bible. But, but not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope there's hope again and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us and then Hebrew 12 to looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross who for what the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the, sh the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And, and at the beginning of this year, we were praying as a leadership, and this particular verse triggered something in me. What was the joy that Jesus saw, you think, that made him go to the cross? Was it the joy of obedience that his Father wanted him to? Was it the joy of salvation? That's what he was going to give all of us. Was it the joy in believing that once he did this, everyone would be saved? Was it that joy that was in the midst of suffering? That saying, I have to take the cross, but I can see on the other side a whole host of people being saved from their sin and death. Was it that? What was the joy set before him? And sometimes joy is like that. It is set before you as a future state. I'll give you an example. Let's say you put on 10 kilos over Christmas. That's not joyful, is it? The turkey was good, the, you know, whatever you ate was really good. But you went on the weighing scale on the 3rd of Jan and says, and then you say, for the joy that is set before me, <laughs> for the next one month, I'm going to eat just green color things, right? You could decide that way. But that's the joy set before you. You work towards something in the future, not because it's joyful right now, but because it produces a harvest after you finish working through that. And sometimes joy, so in that sense, joy is much deeper. If you've seen that movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, Will Smith, famous movie, uh, and in the pursuit of happiness is a bit different. In happiness, you want to be happy from day one to day hundred. But in joy, you can be in difficulty from day one to day ninety-nine and get your joy on the hundredth day, right? That's the difference between happiness and joy. Guess how many times happy or happiness is mentioned in scripture? Compared to 430 joys, 10. 
that's how serious scripture is about happiness. Scripture is not big on happiness. Scripture is big on joy. Right? And, and this world is big on happiness. It's, it's involved in the pursuit of happiness. And people get so happy that they end up going for a heart checkup like me. You know, so I, I, did, I did my last uh, version with my doctor recently. And then uh, I, I was preparing for the preach at the same time. And I sang to myself, a merry heart is like a medicine uh, going there. Uh, and then they found um, in, in my CT scan or whatever, a double beat uh, by Gemini or whatever they call it. Uh, so I was in a happy state, so it, it didn't matter because God looks after the heart. But it's also all the years of not looking after myself that has got me here and I'm trusting God to bring things back. But in that situation, to have joy sitting in a CT scan machine lying down with something all over your face, it's not easy. I asked God to give me that joy and he did. I was singing in the machine, which is fine. But joy is something that is available to us in the middle of difficulty, suffering, trials, and hardship. It's like a deep well, right? Think of it. Think of a deep well somewhere here in your spirit. There's a deep well here. Happiness is like a shallow stream out there. But joy is a deep well. You can dip in. You can take of it, taste of it, enjoy it in God's presence, which is what Sam Storm said in the beginning, that joy is not the absence of suffering, but it's the presence of God. In God's presence, you're always joyful. There's this song that people sing these days. I found the lyrics really interesting. It's called New Wine. You must have heard it. It says, in the crushing, in the pressing, you are making new wine. In the soil, which means you're under the earth now, I now surrender, you are breaking new ground. So I yield to you, into your careful hand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. And, and, and even though sometimes you're feeling crushed, like that grape that's getting crushed, sometimes the skin is coming off and the flesh is being peeled out and the seeds are being thrown away, and you feel so crushed. Remember, he's making new wine. He's making new wine of our situation. Believe in God. Trust in him. He will come through. The last joy. Kingdom joy. The joy of the Lord is my? That's a, is one verse I never could understand. What does that mean? The joy of the Lord is my strength. We all say it. It's on arm bands. It's on various slides all over the place. What does it mean? Okay, let's see some verses first. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking. Remember that at Christmas time. <laughs> but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Isn't that amazing? Righteousness because he gave it to us for free. Peace and joy because it comes from what he did for us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, good, bad, and ugly. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Which means that joy that comes to us is from the Holy Spirit when he enters you and fills you. Yeah? The joy is from God himself. Now, Nehemiah 8, 10 is an interesting verse. Then he said to them, so the, s the context here is that God's people finally get a hand uh, on God's word. And after a long time, they're hearing God's word being read out for five or six hours. And they all, in the end, after hearing God's word after such a long time, are crying. And they're very emotional. They're a bit upset. And then he, he says this verse, but he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine. And send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Which means on a holy day, when you are in God's presence, grieving is not an option. Grieving is 
is not an option. You know why? In God's presence, in his holiness, with all that he has done for us, there is no room to grieve anymore. The only option we have is to rejoice. The joy of the Lord is your strength, which means God himself will bring you joy. God himself will get your joy back to you. And God has done through his son exactly that, brought that joy back into your life. Right? And you, uh, just the last verse, Psalm 16, 8 and 9, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. Now, the kingdom of God, one of the foundations of God's kingdom, like we did last week, one of the big foundations is love. The other big foundation is joy. And then you will hear peace next week. But this is part of who we are. The joy is meant to be in our spirits, in our hearts, from what he's done. And that last verse I put up there, because he is always before me, which means when you're in God's presence, the joy is an automatic buy-in. You get it as a default. It comes to you. So what's your scale on 1 to 10? How do you feel? How do you feel today? I mean, don't, so I think sometimes the world deceives you in such a way that we always end up being a little short of where we want to be, a little grumpy, a little upset about things around us. But that is not default state for someone in Christ. We stand before a God who's joyful and he wants to put that joy in your heart today. Let's just finish with that. But I have four things that will help you keep your joy alive. Shall we go there while we finish? Number one, trust and obey. I've, I've settled on choruses today. That's a chorus. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. First default option, please, if God is stirring you up over something in your life, just obey. The joy will always come back. Don't struggle, don't argue, don't fight. Live in the good of your salvation. That's another chorus. The cross before me, the world behind me. The problem we have is we do it reverse sometimes. We keep the world before us and try and imitate all that they have. And we lose the cross and then we have trouble. Number three, in the tough times, keep hoping and believing. He's working on all things, right? And even in the most difficult circumstance, understand that God has given you his joy and he will sort things. All things work for good to them that are, then that love God and are called according to his purpose. Remember, all things will work for good. Say, all things will work for good. But that's only for a particular type of person, those who love God, and who are called according to his purpose. And then always set the Lord before you. And if you set the Lord before you, nothing will shake you. Nothing will disturb you. Even if circumstances are crazy, God is with you. He will take you through. I want you to stand. Let's finish there. And I want you to say an old chorus with me. I don't have the, the courage to sing it, but maybe I can get... Liz uh, and Jacob John, both are good singers, to help me sing this one. Say after me at least for a start, and maybe we can sing if we have uh, the ability. Say, a merry heart, a merry heart is like a medicine. Like a medicine, like a medicine is a merry heart. A, merry heart. a broken spirit, a broken spirit dries, the dries the bone, but a merry heart, a merry heart is the joy of the Lord. Which means when your heart is merry, you actually become healthier. There's this story that Bill Johnson talks about where a friend of his went to a doctor and he is terminally ill. The doctor had no answers because it was stage four or whatever. The doctor said, just as a joke, because he was also a, a believer, he said to him, go pick up every funny movie you can find and for the next few weeks, watch every movie you can and just laugh and, and enjoy your life. Six weeks later, they did a test, and every sign of that disease was gone. <laughs> was gone. 
A merry heart is like a medicine. And you know what dry broken bones do? They just eat you up because inside your bones is the factory that makes your blood. And if your bones get dried up, you have big trouble ahead, right? So watching that you have a merry heart is very crucial for your own present and future. Always smile, always enjoy your day-to-day -day living with God, right? Shall we try singing that song? Yes? A merry heart is like a medicine, like a medicine is a merry heart. A broken spirit dries the bone, but a merry heart is the joy of the Lord. Thank you very much.